people start connecting, putting their cameras on, grab their coffee, because we will start the second session, which is uh, particularly focused on, so we have addressed in the morning how to access funding. Now in this afternoon, the key point is um, not the access, but that funding is available uh, in the right way, okay? So um, we, we will follow the same structure in the morning. We will start with uh, inspirational uh, presentations and uh, then uh, we will break into groups and then we will, build, uh, we will build jointly recommendations. Three main topics in this session, enhancing coordination between funds and administration. This has been an issue that was raised. Stop working in silos. How do we make the different funds and public administrations work together to support the place-based integrated development uh, for rural areas that is uh, uh, advocated in the vision. Second topic, strengthening the territorial development tools. Uh, here we can talk about leader, but as well others, ITIs, et cetera. So CLLD, ITIs, and other tools that are also available. Uh, and the third one is on innovative ways to mobilize and combine uh, different funding sources, okay? So without further ado, I would like to first check if uh, Arnau is in the room. Yes, so I would like to welcome uh, Arnau Keral. He's from the government of the region in uh, the region of Catalonia. They have been uh, leading uh, the work around the rural agenda uh, in the region, which is some sort of rural vision, as I understand. Uh, they also put in place uh, mechanisms to really enhance this coordination between different regional administrations, coordinating the actions that are, and how they are supporting these actions within the agenda. So uh, we, would, we would like to uh, learn a bit more from that experience in Catalonia. So Arnau, thank you very much for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you to you, Enrique. Um, I would like and to... my colleague Danilo is going to share the slides on your behalf. So let him know when you want uh, Perfect. to change the, the I will response. do, I will leave. I will do. But first of, first of all, I would like to to thank you for, for this kind of invitation on behalf of the of the rural part of the rural agenda steering committee in, in Catalonia. Um it is um for us the the, the rural park or the rural agenda is is a tool for uh, say improving the quality of life. Uh, of rural uh, areas, but it's also a matter of, uh, it's a way to build trust among all the stakeholders and uh, institutions working on the uh, on the rural areas um, and rural development. So it's 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 important to 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 know this and that we're putting a lot of effort and all people in charge of the of the or involved in that rural agenda in Catalonia are putting a lot of effort because it's the uh, the risk of doing something uh, that is only paper. It's a nice paper. It's not. It's, it's there, there. We cannot afford this risk. And this is why we have work a lot. Okay, put a lot of effort in order to make the this vision. Uh, something real. So, um, having said this, uh, yes, if you go to, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. You know, here we have, this is a very short, a very informative slide. So, we, the rural agenda is, uh, let's say, is a part of a triangle work with the urban agenda and also the 2030 agenda. This, overarching a strategy. So we try to to fix the, the, the to create a, a common framework uh, in order to promote policy coherence and to improve communication about all the initiatives that the government is just is boosting on, on, on in terms of societal development. We identified seven um, challenges that you can you can see them here and, and we can share with you the uh, all this the presentation but at the end after a process where uh, more than one hundred, yeah. Well, so in this during this process with more than uh, one thousand two hundred contributions and thirty and three hundred fifty organizations taking part in the process, uh, in the participatory process, we we identified uh, four hundred uh, 
42 actions that are that comes from their actions that have a very inspiration aspirational compound so they, this is our, this what uh, 842 actions are let's say uh, the aspiration of rural territories um, in regard of uh, agriculture system forestry connection ecological transition uh, well-being and, democ and, and democratic change uh, and governance but also innovation because all of participants raise the point that uh, rural areas are also innovative we can uh, shift to the uh, to the can move to the uh, next slide please okay so this process had a very i think that it was a fantastic idea to commission to 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 give a mandate to four institutions uh, in charge of the of drafting. I mean, they, they, the government created a, a drafting committee, a rural agenda drafting committee with four institutions with a very strong um, territorial, um, say, uh, implementation, uh, implication. So these four institutions were responsible also for building this, this consultation process that took place during the COVID period and having 2,000 people and, uh, and, and 2,200 people and 350 organizations just participating in the various workshops around Catalonia online because and also in person during the COVID was not easy. The agenda was approved by the, by the government uh, on May 2022 and the government took the, 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 the commitment to promote actions over which it is competent based on the 842 actions including the agenda then what the government did was to uh, change i mean the government had a, a interministerial commission on rural um and rural uh, development it changed i mean on rural depopulation uh, and after we delivered this document that the, the aspirations of civil society to the government um, the government took decisions to change the name and the functions of this previous commission, and uh, this new commission is uh, the name is is more wide is is the Interministerial Commission on Rural Governance, and it is in charge of the coordination, the implementation, and the the follow up of the of the rural agenda. But this is only a part of the governance system. And this Interministerial Commission on Rural Governance, governance. With a technical working group where there is a person representing the Ministry for uh, the, the Secretary for Rural Agenda, but also a person from the Interministerial the General Direction for uh, Interministerial Commission at the Presidential Department, but also a member of the representative of the Ministry in charge of uh, territory, and finally member of the uh, Steering Committee of this Rural in Catalonia. This is only one piece, but this is a government, and, and this means that this commission is just trying to to engage all, and I mean all ministries, in the in the the, the deployment of the rural agenda. But we have also another important piece, which is the the, the parliament, and and yesterday, on the on the thirteenth of December, the parliament approved. The, the creation of the rural agenda follow up commission it at the Europe, at the Catalan Parliament and this is crucial because the Parliament will control the Parliament will make a follow up will control the gov the implementation of the of the agenda but also about the, the implementation of the of the funding of these actions and the third piece of these governance systems is that the system is the civil society so we enlarge the former rural agenda drafting committee with new members and then we consolidated uh the, let's say the the core of the leading organizations participating in the consultation process and we and the government created together with the the, the, as I said, the, the former drafting committee of that rural agenda let's say uh, a driving committee what we say that the, we call the rural pact steering committee with 35 
organizations from the civil society which have the main the main function of this uh, this of these committees to make a follow up the the implement the deployment of the agenda by the government the government to interact with the government and then also to interact with uh, the, the the parliament in order and, and to promote the the action from both uh, organizations for the government and the parliament and this is also the uh, let's say um steering committee which is responsible also for analyzing uh, new challenges and proposing new actions because the, the, the rural agenda is and should be and will be uh, an open document that it's able to and a flexible document that is open for improvement uh, according to to the evolution of rural areas in catalonia uh, next slide please we saw these three pieces uh, of the government systems, but in re regarding the, the deployment of the rural agenda, what the government is doing now via, via through this, uh, the, this, uh, this interministerial, com interministerial commission and this, this technical committee is to identify how the 842 actions, but especially the 277 priority actions are included in the in the current plan for the, the, for the in the in the in the government plan in the government plan for the current uh, term and also how these actions are included or not um, in the uh, in all the in the initiatives or plans or strategies uh, approved by the and led by the different by the different ministries so uh, this is not easy uh, and it's not enough i mean perhaps some of the actions are included in the in the in the government plan or in some um, let's say sectorial um, commissions uh, sectorial pl planning or sectorial strategies but the, the 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 degree of coverage of these of the, the, the initiatives i mean it's not only the name of the initiative i mean it, it, we are just checking if the the the, the we are just trying to localize or to to make these aspirations this uh, of the city in concrete this means to and, and when we analyze how these actions are included in the planning this means that we try to analyze how the aspiration relates to concrete actions but what we see what we have seen until now is that that 22.4 percent of the actions proposed by civil society are included who interpret the interpretation that they are included in the in the current planning but this is important with various degrees or different degrees of coverage and here this is the, the point how we this is the, also the place for uh, the parliament the place for this uh, road pack the same committee how we make sure that the coverage is total and it's not partial because um, otherwise there is a way to, to to make sure again it's a matter of trust that what do we civil society included in the rural agenda is really in the agenda of the government and it's also uh in the in the budget of the of the of the government Let, let's wrap up now please yeah so this is i mean we have Aspiration from the civil society that we are society that you have, I mean, we are society in an action plan by the government, and we have a three uh, a government system with three key elements: the government, we have interministerial commission with all ministries on board. We have the civil society uh, very active in this ten, in this steering committee with thirty five uh, organizations dialoguing with the government. And with the parliament and following following up the the, uh, the implementation of the plan and finally we have also the, the parliament that will control the government and will propose actions and 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 will also they uh, control the budget but again here now that we, what we are just the, the, the last sentence is that we are working in the first semester of the, of 2024 uh that this civil society and 
and not a government will work on rural proofing. So how this um the initiatives approved by the government are just adapted to, to the rural or take uh, take into account rural rural areas. Uh, and now it's time for implementation. Again, it's not an easy step, it's not an easy process uh, with a lot of political uh let's say bottlenecks, but we are managing them in a very successful way and but the process is still there. So we are still in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arnau, for sharing uh, this this example. I will take uh, questions. I see Neil, your hand raised. I will I will take questions at the end of the three presentations. I think your example exemplifies uh, very well. Uh, I mean, it's 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 aligned very much with the European process, right? You have in place uh, a rural vision. You're putting in place the, uh, a rural pact, a rural pact coordination group. Uh, you have this this governance structure to to really coordinate different administrations to see how they are implementing this very transversal vision that you have in the region. So I think it's a, it's a, it's an excellent example uh, for for inspiration. And now even you are working on on rural proofing. So you're really taking the uh, the EU path, uh, translating it at, at your regional level. So it's a it's a great example. Um, I would like to, as I said, questions, we try to take them at the end. I'd like to move now to a presentation to exemplify uh, the strength, I mean, on, related to the topic on strengthening uh, um, territorial development tools. So I'd like to give the floor to Renata from the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs of Czechia. She will talk how they implement leader multifunded, uh, uh, leader CLLD, multifunded CLLD in Czechia from the side of the ESF. Fund. So today we were uh, we are going beyond only the CEP. We are looking at as well other other policy instruments supporting as well rural areas. So Renata, thank you very much. Welcome, and my colleague uh, 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 will Danilo will share uh, your slides. Please let him know when to change it and to change them. And more or less seven minutes for you as well. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Enrique, and thank you for this. Uh chance to contribute uh, to this interesting and open forum uh, by an example um, of, uh, of the, I must say now, a quite a rare concept of multi-fund uh, CLRD, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, by spreading the good practice, uh, we might help a little bit uh, to spread this concept as well within the countries. Uh, so. I will present you and share with you the experience of operational program employment uh, that is uh, funded by European Social Fund, and we are um, one. Uh, we are one part of our uh, multi-fund CLRD family um, that we are very proud of, and uh, uh, we are even expanding uh, in the Czech Republic because in this programming period. Uh, we gained um, another operational program, and now five operational programs are involved uh, in CLRD multi fund. So uh, let's jump to the first slides, please. And um, so I'm going to talk about operational program employment and about the measures uh, of uh, CLRD uh, within this operational program. Uh, where the overall objective uh, is the support of uh, uh, of persons that are socially excluded or in danger of social uh, exclusion and uh, who live in rural areas uh, that are covered by the strategies of local action uh, groups. Uh, the main uh, interventions uh, go to social inclusion uh, measures such as uh, community work, uh, social work. I will uh, have uh, two examples uh, of uh, those. Uh, shared and informal care and palliative and home uh, hospice care, including, uh, for example, a concept of home sharing, um, debt counseling, um, etc. Uh, then we have uh, employment uh, programs uh, to support employability and local employment, uh, to create work opportunities in rural areas or to adjust the working conditions uh, to the needs of uh, target groups. 
uh, and um, another area of activities uh, is aimed at support of uh, families, of reconciliation of, uh, of uh, private and working life, uh, activities uh, like uh, children's care facilities or children's uh, clubs and youth clubs, uh, etc. Um, we have activities to support uh, families in unfavorable situations uh, to help them to increase the parental competencies, uh, activities uh, between uh, generations uh, to, to make the connections, um, etc. So you can see that actually the offer of activities that we have for local action groups uh, is uh, very, uh, very wide. And uh, they have uh, they have many opportunities what they can choose uh, to support in their areas uh, what is needed according to their strategies, and uh, we try to address by these uh, activities uh, the challenges that are typical for rural areas, and uh, you 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 face uh, many of those as well, such as aging of population. Uh, commuting and not sufficient uh, transport services, uh, missing activities for uh, young people, uh, missing work opportunities, etc. Uh, so now uh, let's let's go uh, let's go to the next slide. Yes, and uh, I'm going to give you two examples of uh, projects or activities uh, to have some practical insight because I think it's uh, very important and. It's very important for us uh, as well as the managing authority to collect good practice and to have the knowledge about uh, our projects. So we do uh, study visits uh, with our team, et cetera, not, not to be disconnected and not to uh, make some, uh, some activities that wouldn't match the needs uh, from the field. So first uh, activity is uh, community work and uh, community centers, uh, which is quite spread uh, within uh, LEX projects, uh, which is uh, quite uh, natural and obvious um, uh, because it's about activization and participation and empowerment of the members of the uh, community. Um, uh, I have this, uh, and I picked uh, one of the examples um, of good practice that we have. We have many of those, of course, and this is local action group uh, Brde Voltava, uh, who are very successful in uh, including various target groups uh, in community center uh, and into the community. Uh, local action group is a very active actor in uh, community planning of social services, and they are particularly successful uh, in working with uh, endangered families and children. Uh, and they, for example, prove to be very flexible as local action groups all are, um, uh, and they can uh, reflect very quickly um, uh, the immediate needs. Uh, so um, when there was the COVID pandemic and uh, children by their own homeschooling, and it was very difficult for some of the families and children to, to uh, follow the classes. So they had individual tutorials uh, for them. Uh, they welcomed Ukrainian refugees. This is, um, I would say, recent, but it's quite a long as well <laughs> issue. Um, they embrace them in the community and they do lots of volunteering work. Uh, they have uh, they have the food bank for the locals, for, for the newcomers, uh, community wardrobe, etc. So this is a very good example. Uh, we can move to the next one. Uh, which is um, social work. Uh, that is a concept that is very strictly defined by the law and it has official standards and duties. And after the discussions uh, with the responsible department of our ministry, we decided to open this activity for uh, local action groups as well, because there is a strong need uh, from, especially from the rural areas, from the small municipalities uh, that are not obliged by, uh, to, by the law to have a social worker uh, to, to deal with the uh, social issues of the inhabitants, but there is a strong uh, need uh, for that. Um, because the mayors uh, don't re don't usually have the expertise and the capacity uh, to deal with that. Um, so it was the need uh, coming again uh, button up, and um, uh, there is um, a strong slightest effect, as I would say as well, which is the change of mindset as well, because uh, uh, it's got strong educational 
uh, effects, uh, you know, on, on the mayors uh, who couldn't at the beginning recognize the need and understand uh, the capabilities of uh, social work. And this is uh, actually a new concept because uh, it's a shared social worker uh, for, for many of these small uh, municipalities in uh, within some area. Um, and we have more examples of, of those as well. So if we can jump to the last slide, uh, I would like to um, uh, pick some, some points uh, such as uh, we, uh, what we built on. We built on, uh, on uh, and, uh, all the aspects that uh, CLLD and local action groups uh, bring along. Uh, we have a very strong base of local action groups uh, in the Czech Republic uh, who are very open and willing to learn and expand. So it was very nice to, uh, to start to cooperate uh, with them. And actually, since uh, the, the very beginning, uh, when uh, uh, it started uh, multi-fund uh, in, in the Czech Republic, and uh, we joined with the Operational Program Employment, uh, CLLD, we opened up uh, the dialogue uh, with, uh, with all the stakeholders, and especially the local action groups, uh, in order to, uh, to learn uh, what is needed and uh, how to design uh, the operations in the best way. Uh, so I think that the communication communication is the key thing. Um, of course, we have uh, because we have multi fund. We don't have the lead fund. Uh, we have separate uh, separate um, measures within uh, five operational programs uh, for leader and CLLD. Uh, we have re regular meetings with uh, colleagues uh, from other ministries, and uh, as, a, as I believe to our experience. Uh, uh, we are very much for this uh, model because I, uh, if, even though it could be a little bit more demanding for local action groups, especially at the beginning, uh, there is a clear ownership uh, of, of, uh, of the measures within uh, separate operational programs and it's very important for the advocacy and it proved for us uh, as well when we were actually uh, going from one programming period uh, into the new one. Uh, what is very important is the learning process and the capacity building. I think we heard it uh, through the day today uh, a lot as well, uh, of course, on uh, all levels. Um, and at the moment, we are very much focused on, uh, on um, uh, supporting uh, monitoring uh, uh, and self-evaluation of the local action groups uh, of their measures that they carry out within operational program uh, employment. Uh, um, they should monitor the achievements of, of the interventions and the progress of the target groups uh, to have good data for evaluation. Actually, this is the condition in, uh, in order for them to apply uh, for the next uh, project. And I think, again, it's very important for the legitimacy and for advocating uh, of CLLD. Uh, and another important thing for us is spreading good practice on national, but as well uh, on, on the European level. And we hope to uh, inspire others. And I just put a small note as well that we plan to innovate uh, what do we do. And we are, uh, we are now discussing a pilot on uh, urban CLLD. So we're not stopping. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Renata. Thank you for the comprehensive uh, presentation. Thank you for presenting this uh, the, this example of multifunded CLD, which brings additional resources to rural areas. It mobilizes resources from the social fund to cover many of the social uh, aspects. Thanks a lot. Uh, now we want to move to uh, a presentation that exemplifies a good example. Um, for the third topic that we will cover in the discussions in this afternoon on innovative ways to mobilize and combine different funding sources. And I'd like to welcome Mauricio O'Brien from the crowd network, uh, crowdfunding network. He will uh, um, explain an example on how uh, he uh, or his organization is uh, getting to uh, a match funding mechanisms to combine crowdfunding and EU funds uh, together to support the implementation of of projects. So Mauricio, the floor is yours. I'll share, I'll share my presentation directly, if I may. Uh, 
Okay, super. Boop, 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 boop. Ah, super. Uh, okay, we good. Um, it's an honor to be here, uh, especially as a fan of of the rural pact and and how to deploy uh, like development policies into the rural. Uh, I must say that it's an opportunity to bring in a piece of the puzzle for that pu pipeline that has been mentioned uh, along the way of, of funding. And how does crowdfunding fit in? Um, crowdfunding provides, this is not said by me, said by the European Commission in 2014 report, brings in transparency, legitimacy, cooperation and solidarity. Okay, under those four pillars, we could build in policies that even trigger even more uh, that participation. What does uh, match funding come in? It's a combination of public and private funds and brings in the elements of triggering citizens' participation. You can exploit crowdfunding IT infrastructure's potential, build in alternatives for true impact in local organizations that are really resilient. And one, last but not least, democratizing access to finance. Anybody could support a project and could also request funds. If we think on the funding uh, funding cycle perspective, has a lot to do with the SMEs that are potentially working in the rural for uh, developing that mission. To give you um, a first X-ray that uh, how this digital world or how this fintech could fit in on a national level and a rural context. We've been working on a, on a research and we've been mapping more than, more than 400 initiatives in rural Spain, in which they were using crowdfunding as a Swiss tool. It has donation, reward, lending and equity, different sect uh, economic sectors that relies a bit in that multi-sectorial approach that it was mentioned earlier before, or even which areas of innovation they're bringing in. This is crucial when we're talking about which projects we're funding. But we have to go down deeper. Big data comes with crowdfunding and why Spain? Spain was the first one to develop um, a match funding mechanism, public and private with a crowdfunding platform. The first one to use crowdfunding and structural funds in this case. Rural doesn't come last, okay? And even uh, the first license in pan-European aspect, it is uh, crowd Crowdcube based in, based in Spain. There was a mention on financial exclusion, rural development, population, demographics, how does could that fit in? This is where data comes, comes through and which uh, projects have been funded in rural communities or even depopulated areas. How and what match funding brings is that piece of the puzzle. It's, cool. it's a hybrid model in which public and private could participate through a crowdfunding campaign. It's developing a full program under four basic steps. The entity, public authority, local initiative, regional authority, you name it, defines the program, which funds they've got available, uh, sets which is the area or the strategy that they want to work upon, which are the, the ones that are given a criteria to work afterwards on the third pillar, joining forces with a crowdfunding platform and specifically driving all the criteria that are public, that are accessible, that are transparent with that potential match. What if we use match like those structural funds in pro promoting these projects? Let me bring you in and introduce you a case, a remote case in the middle of, of Catalonia, north, north um, uh, west of, of the territory, and have they used twice this uh, model using leader funds in a consortium of local authorities bringing in th those funding to promote six projects specifically with 24,000 euro funds for them. It's combined and focused on rural development, it's social entrepreneurship, even young, talented, talented young entrepreneurs, and they develop a full pipeline with a crowdfunding platform, defining location, defining the type of, of of matching that they want to do and which are which is the contribution mix. If we look about it, look look for, about this picture, it's small local authorities in collaboration with the LAG are articulating a full proposal for that funding uh, mechanism with the, a specific criteria, with that uh, funding accessible. What what matters the most is the results of bringing in that citizens' participation in the full funding program. In 2020 as addition, they rise, the full program rise 73,000 euros, and in 2022, 103,000 
uh, euros. And they're going for another uh, annual uh, co like call in 2024. This particular case, you see the different regions, different locations of those social entrepreneurship. Those six programs were fully that those six projects were fully successful, uh, successful when the when they went for the crowdfunding platform. It's not something just from Spain, um, because it, it I did mention that the first one was Spanish, was in the Junta de Extremadura, did develop a full funding program for social entrepreneurship in a, in under Interreg uh, program with federal funds. We have the case of combining crowdfunding platform and microcredits by a regional uh, bank, which is in the uh, Berlin Investment Bank, providing microcredits of a crowdfunding campaign, which is uh, top up. And last but not least, how one crowdfunding platform requests the European Investment Bank for a loan for social and green entrepreneurship. And if we bring it into the policy, this is how the lines of action and the lines of funding could be combined. And now that we are close to Christmas, why not? I'm going to do some, some general uh, implementations or recommendations and other more specific. We've, we know that crowdfunding has proven to be a powerful tool for this small scale experiments in which they have an agile access to funding. But the most important part is there is a lot to be done building those more cultivate those collaborative ecosystems to encourage and facilitate crowdfunding to support research and development of educational programs within data because we got tons of data that, uh, that thanks to the fintech we could build in this bridges in between technological infrastructure and private and public consortiums beginning and also digital transition comes in we have to reduce those barriers sometimes on, on the regulatory side for crowdfunding platforms to collaborate with public authorities to simplify those procedures and unify those criteria. Last but not least, and the most specific ones is we have to invest in capacity building, not just for the promoters and the, the entrepreneurs in itself that they do know about crowdfunding, but policymakers and controllers and how to adjust funding. We have to educate on the re regulatory aspects and tax aspects because of the new European regulation for crowdfunding platforms on the financial side, ECSPR is fully in place. We have to cultivate and those environments for supporting innovation and in local communities and embrace that and foster that culture of innovation. It's empowering co-responsibility and self-sufficiency for the rural area, and especially to cultivate their rural sovereignty through specifically community finance, which is very, very traditional. Anyhow, there's many, uh, many cases I could show you and we'll have, I hope, chances to, to share and we'll comment, please enlighten me and help me out to, to just share more information with you and I'll be more than happy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, for the very uh, rich presentation, very concise, uh, and to the point and sticking to the more or less seven minutes. Thanks a lot. So uh, there was a question before, I think, after uh, Arnau uh, presented. So I'd like to give the floor now, because I know he would have to leave very soon. Uh, I think Nell, Nell uh, uh, Turley. Yeah, hi. Good, yes. uh, good afternoon. Um, okay, so the majority of the funding is going towards uh, local local uh, municipal uh, organisations. Um, obviously, there's a large amount of the population in these areas with cities and towns, but obviously this this uh, this forums about the rural community, which has been depopulated, as we all know. So, therefore with the local resources not having real sufficient resources um, to really tackle the issues in the rural areas, there are a couple of uh, barriers that I see. For example, with the majority of the projects uh, for funding will be involved with the Green Deal, um, they will be trying to do a business plan to um, do some of the services themselves in terms of energy or waste or food or community services, which at the moment are serviced and uh, financed by the municipal uh, 
organizations. Sorry, sorry, Neil, I don't want to interrupt you, but, but yeah. we really need uh, have time for a sure, quick sure, question. Sure. I'll, get, I'll get into or, the question. You know, we'll we'll have more time to... Sure, sure, sure. So the thing is that there will be some pushback by the municipal resource, the municipal organizations, because they will be charging the, uh, the smaller communities for these services and the utility companies too. So the question that the two questions I have are, what are the solutions to overcome these, these, these issues of pushback and barriers to going ahead with the project concerning um, replacing the services of the municipal and utility services? And secondly, how do you budget that in your grant? Because it's a risk. And um, if you don't know, unless you've got a political party behind you, you don't know if you're going to get a pushback later on or they're going to ask for really huge amount of regulative uh, inputs to, to undertake the, the grant. So I think this is the two barriers I see for um, kind of small community projects going forward. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody is uh, really in a position at the moment from the three speakers to respond to that. Otherwise, I, I, I really uh, leave this question. Uh, probably you are in group six, it's about finance, probably could be tackled there or probably could be tackled as well in group five around territorial uh, development. Uh, probably it's an issue that could be further discussed there. Um, thank you very much, Neil. So without further ado, because we are lagging a little bit behind, um, let me, uh, so we will now uh, switch to three groups as in the morning, you have uh, the, you have been numbered according to the uh, specific uh, group. Um, in this sense, we are going to have the three I mentioned. Uh, group uh, number four is going to be uh, talking about uh, coordination of, of funds. Let me put the slide up so you can uh, see it better and assess whether you will be in, in the uh, right group for you. Very quickly, voila. So group number one, uh, four, enhancing coordination and complementaries between funds. We have seen an interesting approach in Barth in Catalonia. Uh, we will see other, other approaches as well in the groups. Group number five is strengthening territorial development tools and group number six related to innovative ways of mobilizing uh, finance to support projects. Uh, the same focus as in the morning, we want to explore what are the approaches that work and how we can make them happen. Okay, and then we will come back together to build recommendations. So, uh, if you want, you want to switch the group, you can come back to plenary, and then my colleague Benetta will guide you to the right group. Okay, so without further ado, let's start with the group discussion. Thank you very much.